Hello, in this section we're going to discuss what are called fractional factorial designs. And these are basically uh, smaller efficient designs. In other words, instead of doing a full factorial, we only do a portion of it, usually due to constraints such as uh, budgetary constraints, resources, and in many cases, a, for instance, a 2 to the k, two-level factorial, if k is large, even those designs become rather huge. As an example, a 2 to the 6th, that's six factors at two levels, would be 64 runs. And frankly, most of those runs, in fact, one could argue as much as three-quarters of them, you don't even need uh, to do the experiment. So in this section, we're going to begin a discussion of how to reduce the size of a full factorial experiment when it's simply too large. And one of the earliest approaches are known as fractional factorials. As it, the name sounds, what it does, it takes the entire factorial and takes a fraction of it. And we're going to restrict our discussion to two level designs, that is fractionating two to the k uh, factorials. Now there's an obvious advantage if I only do a fraction of the runs then I save a lot of resources. I don't have to do as many trials, less time, less money spent and so forth. But there's a disadvantage. Uh, to use an old expression there is no free lunch in design of experiments. If I do less trials, especially if I do a lot less trials than a full factorial, I run into a problem. Well, with traditional uh, fractional factorials, the problem is something we call confounding or aliasing. R.A. Fisher, you know, the founder of design of experiments, used the word confounding in the 1920s. And what he meant is, when we do less trials, we have the problem that some of the potential effects um, cannot be separated. So we're going to see in a moment in fractional factorials, we often have problems that interactions are aliased with or confounded with other interactions or even with main effects. The more modern term, by the way, for uh, confounding is aliasing. It means the same thing. Okay. So to illustrate, we're going to start with a half fraction. So I'm going to take a full 2 to the k and I'm going to split it in half once. Now there are endless ways you could split the design, but it turns out there are very specific ways to split designs so that you can estimate the most possible effects. It turns out for a half fraction of a full factorial, the approach is very simple. We assume that the largest interaction is of no interest. So in my example on slide three, I have four factors, each at two levels. So a two to the fourth factorial has 16 runs. But suppose due to constraints, I can only do eight runs. I can do half. And by the way, fractional factorials based on two level designs, the fractions always have to be <clears throat> some power of two. So in this case, we're taking a half fraction. So what we have to do is think of it conceptually if I want to lose the ability, I know I'm going to lose the ability to estimate some interactions, what should I start with? Well, how about the biggest interactions? Uh, typically they don't occur and we're really not interested in estimating them. So for a 2 to the 4th, the largest interaction is the interaction of A, B, C, D, a four-way. And I have actually said before, we don't really think about four-way interactions. They typically uh, don't occur, and when they do, they typically are quite small and virtually impossible to figure out. So I'm going to split my design in half from 16 to 8 runs, 
And I'm going to do it in such a way that I only sacrifice the ability to estimate a four-way interaction, which again is of no interest to me anyway. So how we do it, and I'll show in a moment, is quite simple. But on slide four is the design. So the columns A, B, C, D, this is your design matrix. This is what you'd see. But for illustration, I've added all the other interaction columns. Again, you don't see these columns. They're created by statistical software in the background. And they are needed to estimate the model. But you don't need to see them in order to do the experiment. So notice, let's pick one of the columns. Let's say column AB. Notice the plus and minus signs. These indicate that there are high and low settings. And the effect of the two-way interaction is just the difference in the average response for the plus settings uh, minus the average of the response for the negative settings. So notice every column except A, B, C, D has a pattern of plus and minus in low and high settings. So in theory, I can estimate 14 effects. Okay. So if you look across here, four main effects, six two-way interactions, and four three-way interactions. But notice my design only has eight runs. So literally, I have only have eight degrees of freedom or observations with which to estimate effects. And you, can, you know from simple algebra, I can't really estimate 14 unknowns in eight equations. That's exactly what this would amount to. So what's going on? Well, take a look at AB. Now compare it to CD. Notice the pattern is the same. So if I estimate the interaction of A and B, I'm simultaneously estimating the interaction of CD. We say AB equals CD. They cannot be separated. As a matter of fact, is it turns out that <coughs> Every two-way interaction has an alias with another two-way interaction. Also, take a look at column A. Okay. Notice column A, I'll just connect them, matches BCD. So every main effect has an alias with a three-way interaction. And when I say alias, it means that they are exactly equal. So that means I cannot tell the effect of the AB interaction from the effect of the CD interaction. This is what we mean by aliasing and why it is a serious problem in using fractional factorials. We'll show later, sometimes we can figure out if it's really the AB interaction or the CD interaction. But in many cases, we're going to be left with ambiguity. We're not sure. And that may require us to do additional experimentation. And on slide five, I show exactly how the design was created. I add the column A, B, C, D. That's just the product of A times B times C times D. And then I go through, and I just pick out all the runs where A, B, C, D equals 1. So that means I can't estimate the A, B, C, D interaction. I don't really care. But I do have the ability to estimate the main effects and potentially some of the interactions. And by the way, if you pick all the runs where the largest interaction equals 1, we refer to that as the principal fraction. There is a negative fraction. It's equivalent. But by convention, people generally pick the positive uh, fraction or principal fraction. Okay. So how do we set up these designs? Again, 
For a half fraction, it's very simple. You set the design up based upon the largest interaction. So for a 2 to the 5th minus 1, okay, we set up the design based upon the five-way interaction A, B, C, D, E equals 1. By the way, the capital I is a convention we use, and it stands for identity or plus 1. So that's exactly what you do. So a 2 to the 5th is 32 runs. A half fraction is 16. I just picked the 16 runs where A, B, C, D equals plus 1. Okay. So once I pick these fractions, and I typically base it, as I said, on the largest interaction, it's actually very easy to figure out what the aliases are, what's aliased with what. So to show you, I've just uh, stated for the uh, 2 to the 5th minus 1, use A, B, C, D, E. So I equals A, B, C, D, E. Well, if I wanted to know what was aliased with A, B as an example, multiply each side of the equation by A, B. Okay, so AB times the identity is AB. And then notice the right-hand side, I have A squared and B squared. Here's a simple rule. When you do the multiplication, any letter that becomes squared, cross it out. So it turns out AB is aliased with CDE. It turns out, as you can, you can see it visually, for my five-way interaction, every two-way interaction is aliased with a three-way interaction. Generally, three-way interactions don't occur, and they're typically lower in effect than two ways. So often with these uh, type of designs where two ways are aliased with three ways, we simply discount the existence of, of the three-way interaction and just assume that what we're looking at is a two-way interaction. By the way, at the bottom of slide 8, I say, well, what's the alias for AB if I have a 2 to the 4th minus 1 and I split it as usual, I equals ABC? Well, the answer is easy. What this would become is AB writing with my mouse here, equals a squared, b squared, c, d. So I just cross out a squared and b squared. So a, b equals c, d. And I can do that for any of the main effects or two-way interactions to see what the aliases are. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is uh, move ahead to slide 12, and I'm going to talk through the analysis of a fractional factorial experiment. I'm going to primarily do this in jump and discuss uh, some of the material in the notes Okay, while I work through jump. And notice this is a 2 to the 5th minus 1, half fraction of a 2 to the 5th, but for whatever reason, the experimenters appear to have chosen the negative fraction. That is, A, B, C, D, E equals minus 1. Okay. Now, I didn't create this design, so I don't know exactly how they split it. So I wouldn't know exactly what's alias, but my best guess at this point is it's a half fraction created on the negative of the ABCDE interaction. So at this point, I'm going to go over to jump. Okay. And this is the design. And this is about trying to optimize a process to extract peanut oil, obviously, from peanuts. And in each of the columns, by the way, there is a column note that tells you what the variable is. So variable A is CO2 pressure. 
variable B is the CO2 temperature. Variable C is the moisture content of the peanuts. D is the flow rate of CO2. And finally, factor E is particle size. So three variables relate to CO2. Two variables relate to the moisture content of the peanuts and the particle size they've pulverized the peanuts to to see what the effect might be on extraction. Okay, now, if I didn't create this design and I wanted to find out what is aliased, it turns out Jump has a very nice uh, option in the Fit Model platform that will figure it out for you. So I'm going to go to Analyze fit model okay. and what I'm interested is in finding out what all the aliases might be up to three-way interactions so notice the box that says degree okay I'm going to change that to a three and then I'm going to highlight my five factors in the select columns window under the macros button, select factorial to degree. So it creates a model with all of the two-way, three-way uh, effects and main effects, and my response of interest is yield. Okay, so I'm going to run the design, and I get what's called a singularity. If you do an analysis, and you get a singularities report, there's a problem. You should not be getting this if your design and model are correct. What's happened is it's telling you my model contains aliases. That is, it's showing me that uh, DE, the two-way, equals the negative of ABC. And I don't really care about the minus sign. It's what's aliased. And as you can see, every two-way is aliased with a three-way. So what I have to do is go back to my model and remove the aliases. By convention, we typically remove, um, we actually uh, remove the higher order interactions. So I'm going to take out all the three-ways. Okay. I'm just going to discount that they exist. You can't have an alias in a model. It's like putting the same term in the model twice. The equal sign means that DE is entirely equal to ABC. They cannot be separated. Okay. So I'm going to go back to fit model. Okay. And this time, notice it's uh, to degree 2 in the fit model window. I'm going to highlight A, B, C, D, and E, click on the Macros button, and Factorial to Degree 2. Okay, so the three ways are not in the model. Click on Yield and Run. Okay, notice there's no singularity details, but notice that the model's saturated. In other words, there is uh, no way to estimate which of these effects might be significant and which are not. You recall in the fire retardancy example uh, for the full factorial experiments, we call this a saturated design. Since there is no replication, we have no way of estimating experimental error. And I showed you in the 2 to the k factorial section, when you have a saturated design, again, go back and look at the fire retardancy example, Jump has a special platform we can use that helps us do an analysis. So I'm going to go to Analyze. I'm going to go down to Modeling, and then pick Screening, second to the bottom of the drop-down menu. So again, go back to the notes on two-level factorials. 
where we showed how to use the screening platform for saturated designs. So I'm going to click on the responses yield, put in your five factors as X. Remember, screening will look at the structure of your data and will create the largest possible model, taking into account that aliases can, can occur. Okay. So there is the result. Again, it's using Lentz method. Again, I'll, I'll refer you back to the uh, two-level design notes and read the fire retardancy case study in depth. And remember I said, as a general rule, when I look at these designs, I typically go through these individual p-values in any factor with a value, a p-value less than 0.25, I included in the model. So I'm going through and I'm looking at interactions. I'm going to hold down the control key. I'm going to highlight the BA interaction. I'm going to highlight the EA interaction. Okay. And I'm going to highlight A. Okay. So it looks like uh, C and D are not showing up. So one last check. Uh, there is a CE interaction that we, again, I'm picking factors that I'm going to consider using going forward. Okay. And then I'm going to run the model. Okay, it says I'm missing effect C. Okay. So what I need to do is I'm going to regenerate the model. Remember, it's expecting the heredity principle. Since I put EC in the model, it expected me to put main effect C in along with it. Now let's run the model again. So notice our model has e, B, um, A, B, E, and C in three interactions. What's interesting is factor D is not showing up anywhere as significant. So at this point, we can discount D and any interactions involving D as having an effect. And what we would do is then use this as a basis for optimization. And by the way, I believe if we go back to our data table, we look at factor D. Factor D is the flow rate of CO2. So in the flow rate range they were using, it doesn't appear it has any effect, so they can set it at whatever uh, flow rate is most cost effective for them. I would assume a smaller flow rate. And then we can always use the profiler to optimize. So I have the profiler, and I'm going to click on the profiler menu, select desirability functions, and maximize desirability. So what it's telling me is you want to go for E is particle size. Use the smaller particle size. Uh, B, I think, was high temperature for CO2. I think A was, uh, oh, A and B were pressure. And I think C was uh, temperature. I'd have to look it up, but it's giving you the settings to give you the highest possible yield. Okay, so that covers quite a bit of territory in the uh, fractional factorial part one notes. So I'm actually going to jump ahead and talk a little bit about what happens when we take even smaller fractions. So I took a half fraction. Okay. But if k is really large, we've got a lot of factors. Quite often we want much smaller than a half fraction. For instance, a 2 to the 6th is 64 runs. And quite often we do a 2 to the 6th minus 2. We often do a quarter fraction. Or a 2 to the 7th is 128 runs. We typically do an eighth fraction. So how do we generate these smaller fractions? Well, it turns out 
for each time you want to have the design, okay, you have to pick an additional interaction to split on. So what we call each of these interactions, we tend to, yeah, jumped ahead on me, we tend to call them generating relations. Okay. So I need P generating relations, P interactions. Well, it turns out there are infinite ways we could pick these relations and split the designs. Some are better than others. So if I wanted a 2 to the 5th minus 2, I'd first split the design on ABD, the three-way. And that would get me to 16, and then I would get to 8 by splitting on ACE. Okay. Now suppose I wanted a 2 to the 6th minus 3. Okay. I need 3. I've got to split the design in half three times. So notice here are three possibilities. By the way, these were picked by jump. There is nothing intuitive about how they're selected. So don't try to gain some insight into how it's done. It turns out it's all done by brute force searching you know, using various types of numerical methods. This is a very difficult problem, uh, knowing the best way to split a design. And we now live in an era where we just let the computer and optimization uh, algorithms do it for us. Okay. Well, it turns out, of course, and this intuitively you can see that if you keep taking a smaller and smaller design fraction, we're going to get more and more aliasing. And it turns out when I have P generating relations, and I won't go into too much detail, if you took each of those interactions and you did all possible multiplications of them, you'd end up generating an additional set of defining relations. And we, what we call these, we call these generalized generating relations. What that's telling you is, in the end, the aliasing is often very complicated. And we really just rely on software to tell us what's aliased. If you create the design and jump, jump will tell you. Or if you don't know, again, you can use the trick I just showed in fit model and look at the singularity details to see what's aliased. So here's a 2 to the 5th minus 2. Again, there's many ways to split the design. So here's one approach. I split on the four-way interaction. So I take the 16 runs where A, B, C, D equals 1. And then I split those in half on BCE, and that gets me to the eight final runs. Okay. Again, there are many ways this could be split. This is a way that Jump selected. A different software package might pick an equivalent way to do it. But what they're doing is they're saying, well, this is really the best way to split the design. So there's an example of a 2 to the 7th minus 3. And I have three generating relations. And it turns out that there are four generalized relations, or a total of seven. So figuring out what's aliased with what is very difficult. And again, in these days, we just rely on software to solve the problem for us. OK. And then finally, I want to talk briefly about what's called resolution. So I'm taking these fractions, and the, there are different ways to take them. And then how do I characterize the fraction in terms of aliasing? Well, it turns out we use something called resolution. Resolution is simply the number of letters in the shortest um, interaction or word, we often call it a word, in the defining relations set. So if the shortest word has five letters, we say it's resolution five. Resolution two designs we would never, ever use. Notice main effects are aliased with each other, so we just discount those uh, from consideration. Resolution three. In a resolution three design, 
main effects are aliased with two ways. This is actually not desirable and we try to avoid resolution three designs if at all possible. So here's an example of a resolution three design. We split on A, B, C, D, and then we split on B, C, E, okay? And notice <coughs> this creates another interaction, A, D, E. This says A is aliased with D, E. It turns out every main effect is aliased with a two-way. Both type of effects are common. This is not a good design. And resolution four, two-way interactions are aliased with two ways. I don't expect you to memorize this, but you should keep this concept in mind in trying to decide on a fraction you want to use. In general, I recommend you try to use at least resolution four or five. By the way, anything above five, we simply consider it full resolution. There is no aliasing. And by the way, just to show you, when using fractional factorials, we put the resolution as a Roman numeral uh, subscript. That's an old convention. And basically, uh, resolution is used in trying to figure out how to split the design. What we typically do, we use what is sometimes called a minimum aberration design. Basically, we search for the way to split the design that minimizes the total amount of aliasing. So in uh, our designs in JUMP, when we pick them, JUMP is looking for a minimum aberration design, a design that has the minimum amount of aliasing. In other words, we can estimate the most possible effects.